So we received that designation in May of 2011. And what that meant was now I needed to continue with my programming and increase it. Now, it was an interesting experience to try to navigate the funding for me to do this because in the beginning it was really just however I could make it work and oftentimes I didn't think of it as volunteering um, because in volunteering there seems to be an element of doing service. Mm -hmm. I was really doing what I wanted to do so it's hard yeah. for me to say I was volunteering. Yes, yeah. I was doing it without receiving pay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it wasn't because someone was asking me. I was mm -hmm. telling everyone, this is what you want me to be doing. Yeah, right. So I was very bold about it. Yes, yes. <laughs> and so I should mention that during the period of time between going to the, the Board of Commissioners and actually being active with the application, uh, Mary Lou Tatton and her husband John supported my work. Mm -hmm. And then when we received the designation for the uh, to officially be a dark sky park, then the county commissioners made a commitment to pay me in part to do this work. Mm -hmm. Within a year, another individual in the community showed up who g had gathered together uh, an anonymous donation that would support the work completely for three years. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was given the opportunity then to build the programming and create a presence for this park out of my own initiative, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially because there wasn't something, a model ahead of us that would say, here's how you do this. Exactly. Yeah. You have to yeah. fly by the seat of your pants. Yes. And, and be very engaged and very creative, which is what I love. Yeah. yeah. And so in 2011, we received our designation. Then in 2012, I was working with the executive director of the local land conservation organization who a light went off in his head when he realized that all of the land he had been protecting had dark skies over it and that there was an easy way to combine land conservation with night sky protection. Right. It hadn't occurred to him uh -huh. that it was that they went hand in hand. He was very um, well versed in writing legislation and working with state level government. Mm -hmm. So he drafted legislation that then our state representative sponsored at at the House level in the, the Michigan state government. And that, uh, that bill was passed into legislation in 2012 to protect an additional 23,000 acres of state-owned land. So we have 600 acres that's owned by Emmett County. The skies over it are protected by designation from the International Dark Sky Association. And now one year later, the state of Michigan of its own protected 23,000 additional acres of state-owned land mm -hmm. by their own legislation. Mm -hmm. The following year, so this was 2011, our designation, 2012, State of Michigan protects its land. And then in 2013, we were contacted by the National Park Service in the United States, and they have a dark sky management team. And I, I like to think that because of the level of activity and awareness that was generated by what we were doing, they looked into the Great Lakes region where mm -hmm. there are many national park properties Possibilities. and said, we are very interested in what you're doing there and would like to partner with you. So we went from the community, the county level to the state level to the national level very quickly and also throughout that time drawing an audience from an international community. Mm -hmm. It's been very, very exciting. And I have been given the freedom to... Uh, develop the programs, determine the content, invite the speakers, and always what's most important to me is that the guests that come are never given content and information that is dismissive about the cultural beliefs that came before our own time. Right. Because we are at risk of losing the moral imaginations and the moral wisdom that was handed down through the traditions that we now regard as mythologies and folk tales and fairy tales or this make-believe mm -hmm. um, and even if it does stand in the realm of imagination and make-believe it was nourishing something in the soul mm -hmm. and when our science is not informed by this cultural tradition oftentimes it lacks research that satisfies the soul mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so in the programming my effort is always to connect with contemporary science, 
and contemporary thought and belief about the night sky mm -hmm. with how did we get to this understanding mm -hmm. from different cultures as much as I can research and uncover and in that others show up mm -hmm. so I have worked with the local Audubon Society they study the migratory patterns of different birds that come through that region the headlands is a very important piece of property for migrating birds going across the Straits yes. of Mackinac. Yes. They have to, they wait for the thermals, these hot air that uh, can mm -hmm. go, kind of go swooping up mm -hmm. so that they can be lifted and fly out right. over the water. Right. Um, I have worked with the local tribe to do water ceremonies because this park property is on Lake Michigan, which is the fifth largest body of fresh water in the world. world. Mm -hmm. And there's two miles of shoreline there. Yeah. And the waters are very, very important to the people indigenous to this yeah. land. Yeah. And so we do, we have done water ceremonies, particularly when Comet Panstars was visible in 2013. Mm -hmm. Panstars was named for the group of machines that discovered it. Mm -hmm. It means Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System. It's owned and operated by the United States Air Force. A set of telescopes with cameras on them continually scanning the night, the sky. Mm -hmm. And they discovered this comet very far away from us. And it was interesting in my work to try to figure out, how do I tell the story of that? How do mm -hmm. I tell the story of this machine that made this discovery? Yes, yes, yes. So what I did was try to um, uncover where the comet would become visible to the human being. Mm -hmm. And this was in the region of the sky that's referred to as the watery region. It's where you find the constellation Aquarius, the water man. Uh, it's near the Pisces fishes. The water man is as though dipping, uh, pouring his urn, so the water is pouring out into the mouth of um, the southern fish, right at the star Fomo Hot. And then you see the watery creatures are all in this region. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that this was the region where this comet would become visible to the naked eye of the human being. So I thought, oh, we need to tell the story of the water. Right. And I spoke with the local tribal group. There's a, they have a Grandmother Moon drumming circle and they wanted to do a water ceremony. So then I also got an astronomer to speak about comet science, and we had this three, three you could say a threefold event yeah. that started with the ceremony, then went right to the science, and then completed with a story. It was a really lovely event, and there was something for everyone, yeah. because there are many people who come that really just want the straight up astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of people that are coming for the story, most people are coming because they want access to a night sky that's unpolluted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so now, now we're in 2014. We're in 2014. Getting into the summer. Yes, getting into the summer. And the most exciting thing that's happening now is that only three years after receiving this designation, Emmett County has decided to invest a great deal of money and effort and talent into um, designing and building a program building that will be integrated with its environment. So it will have a green roof that makes it environmentally friendly so the, the raptors and the birds that fly over that property will see only natural um, uh -huh. covering. They won't see uh -huh. anything reflecting off a metal roof or anything. Right, right. Um, and the building is designed with the curve of the shoreline and the sweep of the lake in mind. Um, we take in the... the natural slope of the land for the seating area, the outdoor seating area. And so we're in the concept planning stages for this and hope to begin the project in the fall this year mm -hmm. so that we have facility maybe as early as next year, maybe as early as 2015. Mm -hmm. um, right now, when people come, they're coming to a dark wilderness. We have no mm -hmm. facility. We have some benches, but there's mm -hmm. no public restroom. Well, it didn't seem to uh, stop people when it I was there the other no, night. No, it doesn't stop anyone from coming. No. But also we've created such a level of visibility that it's challenging sometimes. People come and they think park. And so there's a mentality that goes with that and an idea. Mm -hmm. Even though you might know it's about the sky, it's like, well, what's a, what's a sky park? Because it's not something you can do on the ground for mm -hmm. so much. Um, so I always have to inform people, you're coming to a dark wilderness, you're going to be sitting on the ground, it's going to get dark, there's no restroom here. No. Nope. And we're not, uh, I don't use a telescope, I don't use laser pointers. Oftentimes I'm wearing a cape, and it's not just to make believe, it's to 
make it very clear that we are, although standing on the earth or sitting on the earth, we are reaching into the stars. And so yeah. the cape is my uh, means of access. Mm -hmm. And when I'm wearing the cape, it's to say now I am sp speaking as someone who would share the stories of the stars. And then when I take the cape off, I'm just a human being. That's it. We're, we're on the earth doing yeah. this. And we have, that. we have that opportunity in every 24-hour cycle. Yeah. Where we can really experience this place of... Um, well, there's waiting for we, what we know is coming in a beautiful way. There's also, uh, you know, we rush here and we rush there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what what does it mean to have the day come to an end and yeah. the night sky and uh, yeah. people in the cities never have that opportunity? No. And no. also to really live in the wonder of the, the feeling it generates when you are looking and you're looking, and then you see a star, and it grows brighter and brighter, and you're very close to that experience of it seeming to not be there, but then it's there. Mm -hmm. And it's that's a rare encounter when you're in a light-polluted environment, when you're not thinking about the sky, but it's, uh, it's strengthening for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It helps us to recognize something that is beyond our daily environment, but is still present for us. Even though we can't touch it physically, mm -hmm. we can know it. Mm -hmm. And and at first we can't see it, but then we can. It's a really valuable experience. And I, off, I love to tell the story there about the ancient Egyptian culture and how the name Osiris was not just assigned to one thing in the sky. It was the first object that became visible and then followed the sun over the horizon at sunset. So the first thing to set after the sun, this is Osiris. This is the god of the dead. He leads the way. Mm -hmm. And then Isis, also not just assigned to one thing. Isis was the goddess at dawn who was the last one visible before the sun rose. So we have these, at least in the Egyptian culture, these mighty beings holding that space and uh -huh. connecting the day to the night and the night back to the day. Okay. And that object, it could be the moon, it could be the planet Venus, it could be the star Pollux. Mm -hmm. It's something different over time, slowly over time. It changes, but that required a a level of awareness and conversation almost that we really have a hard time achieving now. Yeah. So, so that, and, yeah. and we can count on the fact that the sun is going to come up. Yes. And to be you know? in the dark. Yeah. Um, I think, at least in my work, this is not, not based on anything other than my own experience. Mm -hmm. It has been very frustrating, both for me, but also for children, usually before the age of nine. They can't be drawn out too soon into having to recognize patterns. It's hard enough as adults to recognize the patterns of the constellations. Mm -hmm. And so a child doesn't necessarily need it to be pointed out, but to be in the environment in it. where it's happening and hearing the story, yeah. that's very invigorating. Yeah. And uh, that's, a, that's a lovely experience. Yeah. I have uh, my sisters and my daughter live in New York, and my daughter mm -hmm. in, right in New York City. And when I go to visit, I always make sure that I stop on the street corner to, to look and see as many stars as I possibly yeah. can because it's a, it's a more um, philosophical or spiritual idea that not only are the human beings living in that environment not able to see the stars, mm -hmm. but the stars, in a certain respect, are not able to see, see the earth, earth. Yeah, to right. reach the earth in that place. There's, there's a if, veil in between. If a human being can stand in that environment and see Jupiter or the Big Dipper, which mm -hmm. you usually can see the Big Dipper at least yeah. in most urban environments. Yeah. Uh, it makes a difference, yeah. I, I believe. So I try to witness the stars from the light polluted places as much as I can and I'm very grateful that I have access to a very dark night sky. Yeah. Wow, thank you. Okay. It's been a Thank pleasure. You.
and uh, much luck with your work Thank and you. all the people that are connected to it. Yeah. And if anybody wants to know more about uh, uh, you know, the association, I'll put the links below. Wonderful. So. Yes, thank you. So thank Thanks, you, Mary. Mary. Yeah.